Hey everyone, welcome back to another video here on DarkSec. I am Dark, and today we're going to be taking a look at the room uh, Linux backdoors on TryHackMe. Learn all the different techniques used to backdoor a Linux machine. This is going to be how we establish persistence and make sure that we can still get back in after we have compromised the machine. Now, why would you want to learn how to do this? Uh, this is mostly going to be for red team operations when you're doing longer engagements and you want to make sure that you can't be kicked out easily. Losing access to a, a machine that you've already rooted is very annoying. Uh, this is something that even more so for uh, cyber defense tournaments, this is going to be something that you're going to want to know. Uh, I do recommend becoming familiar with command and control frameworks as well uh, as the Linux backdoors, but it, it's good having a mix of that just because if you're kicked out with one method, you still have the other one usually to fall back on. That being said, let's go ahead and dive into task one, introduction. Hey everyone, this room is dedicated for learning common Linux backdoor techniques. A backdoor is simply something we can do to ensure our consistent access to the machine. So even if the machine is re rebooted, shut down, or whatever, we'd still be able to have access to it. Keep in mind, this is when the machine is back on and connected to the internet. Or connected to whatever network we're on, if we're on the same network with it. These aren't actual vulnerabilities, but just ways to maintain access on a target. To recreate a ba or all backdoor techniques shown in this room, you could simply try them all on your own machine or use the THM attack box, as it's safer and it doesn't matter if you screw anything up. And I'm going to go ahead and start the attack box now, just in case we want to replicate any of those. We'll mark that as complete. I get my nice streak there. Let's move into task two, taking a look at SSH backdoors. The first backdoor we are going to look at is the SSH backdoor. The SSH backdoor essentially consists of leaving our SSH keys in some user's home directory. Usually the user would be root as it's the user with the highest privileges. However, if you want to be tricky, you can put them in non-root with pseudo powers. It's one of those things where keep in mind root's going to be under the highest amount of scrutiny. It's a little bit of creativity there to maintain access in this way. So let's generate a set of SSH keys with SSH keygen. To do so, simply run the command SSH keygen as shown below, and we'll do that on the attack machine here in a moment once it is up. So running this is going to run this little sequence right here. Uh, we can enter in a passphrase if we want to have the RSA keys uh, protected with a password. You can see the random fingerprint here and then the random art uh, just showing that the keys that were generated are truly random uh, with this little bit there. When you run this two times in a row, this will be different and that, that's the main purpose of it. Now that we have uh, two keys, one private key and one public key, we can now go to the root.ssh and leave our public key there. Don't forget to rename the public key to authorize keys. And we'll take a look at that in just in a moment. This is just a simple text file. It's not anything very complicated and this can trip people up just because uh, a lot of times it's assumed that this is something more complex than just a text file. If the directory.ssh is not present, you can always create it using the command makedir.ssh. This does need to be in the root home directory or in the home directory of whatever user you're going to backdoor in this way. A lot of times this will exist, especially within a development environment. If you're working in an actively developed uh, server range, that's something that most devs are probably going to be using private key authentication to get in. Now that we have our, left our backdoor, we can simply log in as root. Before doing so, give the private key here, and we'll close this. Give the private key the right permissions using chmod 600 id underscore rsa. And what we're going to go ahead and do is we'll take a look at the .ssh directory. I'll show you where that is, just so that you're familiar with that. And we'll run the id uh, ssh dash keygen command rather to show that generation process. Let's go ahead and keep reading. And once this is ready to cooperate, we'll go into that. So we're going to set the permissions. This is really important. If you do not have the correct permissions on this, the Linux file system will say, hey, this has two permission or two permissive typically uh, permissions. It needs to be locked down a little bit more. This is recognizing this is a sensitive file that we need to treat it as being a sensitive file. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll continue on this in a moment. Let's go ahead and run or we can take a look at the home directory and we do ls, so we can see that we are in the slash root home directory. If we do ls tech lsa to show hidden directories, we can see that we do sure enough have a .ssh directory. If we go to cd.ssh, we are now in that hidden directory, 
And if we run ls, we can see that we do have authorized keys in here. And if we do less on authorized keys, we can see it's just a simple text file. So you have the actual uh, uh, key right here. This is the public key in this specific case. We use the private key when we are going to authenticate. Uh, the private key is the one that we keep to ourselves and don't leave in the public uh, space in this way. So pretty straightforward. If you just have, uh, if you don't have the authorized keys file existing yet, you can either cat uh, the information into it and make the file, or you just rename your uh, key to this. A lot of people will just rename it because it's, well, easier. So uh, with regards to the permissions, this is necessary because if we don't do it, SSH will complain about permissions not being secure enough on the key and will most likely not let us use it. Yep, it will complain a lot. After giving the key the right permissions, we can do SSH-I, so identity key, your ID underscore RSA rather, uh, and then we're specifying the location of this. This is assuming that it's in the same directory that we are running SSH from. Uh, typically this won't be the case, so you'll wanna put either a relative or absolute path there, and then root or whatever user at IP address here to log into our desired machine. One thing to note about this backdoor this backdoor really isn't hidden at all. Anyone with the right permissions, uh, so anyone that can actually log in as root, uh, would be able to remove our SSH public key or the file authorized keys entirely. In what directory do we place our keys? That's gonna be .ssh. What flag in SSH do we use to show our private key, or rather use it? That's gonna be dash "-i". Let's go ahead and we'll cd dot dot to get out of the .ssh directory, and we're gonna jump into task three, PHP backdoors. Let's now get into the second backdoor, PHP backdoors. If you get root access on a Linux host, you will likely you will most likely search for creds or any uh, useful information in the web root. Uh, this is if a website is running on the Linux host. It's very common that if you compromise a website, it's probably going to be Linux. The web root directory is usually located in var www.html. What you have to know is that whatever you leave in var www.html will be available for everyone to use in their browser. Now that you know that, you can try creating a PHP file with any name and try putting this inside, uh, or this piece of code inside of it. So you can see that this is just a PHP code block that is looking in the request for a parameter called command. Uh, and whatever that command is, it's passing to shell exec here from the request. So think of this as just running the command itself. Uh, this gives us a backdoor with potentially a secret file name that uh, we can just use to execute arbitrary commands. This code simply takes the parameter CMD and will execute anything that is being given to that parameter. Notice that we are using the dollar sign underscore request CMD, which means that you can pass the parameter either in a get or in a post request data, uh, which is kind of interesting. Now that the file is saved and ready, we can try to query it. Uh, if you lift the file in var www.html shell.php, this is super obvious, so be aware of that. You should be able to access it directly using, uh, so you can just go to that website. As long as the web server is on and it's running PHP, you should be able to access this. Again, very obvious name. This is something I wouldn't recommend naming it. You ideally, in this case, if you want to actually backdoor a machine, uh, again, for the sake of maybe a competition or if you're maintaining persistence within a penetration test, you're going to want to name this maybe something more benign. Uh, for example, welcome.php or gettingstarted.php, something that people don't want to exist, or maybe administration.php or administration uh, backup.php. Keep that in mind. One of the things there is you want to make sure that it's not obvious. If you left the shell somewhere else, look in what directory it is uh, and try accessing it by doing something like that. So you can just navigate to the subdirectory. Typically, the further down you can hide this, the better. But generally speaking, a lot of production servers, so one thing to keep an eye out for this is a lot of production servers update via scripts, which is really handy if you are a developer. Now, the, <laughs> that's uh, great and all, uh, because uh, it, a lot of times it will just nuke what's in the web directory. Everything there is just going to be gone or overwritten. So you kind of have to play around with that. If you are fighting against something that is being continuously updated, 
you might lose your shell. So this is something that can be a little bit tricky. And again, if it with it being in the web directory and part of the website, anyone can see it. So you might not be the only one using your backdoor. Keep that in mind. Try adding this piece of code in already existing PHP files in var www HTML. Adding it a little bit more towards the middle of files will make our malicious actions a little more secret. Uh, this is something that, keep in mind, organizations will be running checksums in this case, so this will not work. Uh, this is more of a cyber defense thing or against uh, inexperienced um, defenders in this specific case. Uh, this is something that if you're doing a normal pen test, this is not acceptable. This is stuff that if you are just going to find vulnerabilities and you don't necessarily care about being caught, you should not be necessarily focusing on persistence. So just keep that in mind. Change the CMD uh, parameter to something else, anything actually. Uh, you don't really want to have CMD here. This is a massive red flag. Anyone that's done any boxes is, especially people that are more seasoned in industry are going to know what this is and they're going to be looking for it. You understand what a PHP backdoor is? Yep, we do. So we're going to go ahead and mark that as complete and move into task four, cron job backdoors. Uh, this is one of the more interesting backdoor techniques. Let's now get into the third backdoor technique. Uh, this backdoor consists of creating a cron job. Think of this as a scheduled task if you're coming from Windows land. If you take a look at your cron jobs file, which is, and we'll take a look at that, Etsy cron job, you would see something like this. And it looks like we don't have in that, uh, or cron tab rather. That seemed wrong to me. Etsy cron tab, there we go. So we can see that we have uh, just some basic things here. Um, these are ones that just come built in with Kali, so keep that in mind. Uh, but this is the basic structure of a cron tab. We don't need to look at this too, too much. Know that uh, we can schedule tasks with this. A lot of times you just want to copy one that's already there. This represents all the tasks that are scheduled to run at some time on your machine. Once you have uh, root access on any host, you can add any scheduled tasks. You could even just configure a task where every minute a reverse shell is sent to you, which is exactly what we're going to do. Notice the two letters on top of the task, M and H. So we have M right here and then H right here. M is meant to line up with this column and then H is meant to uh, line up with this column. Then we have day of month, uh, month, uh, I believe this is day of the week as well. So you have a lot of configuration and you can see what user it's running as and what the actual command is. Very straightforward, very simple, but very effective for using, especially within a normal management environment. Those are the letters that indicate if the task should be run every hour or every minute. Uh, and uh, we'll get into a little bit of how this breaks down in just a second. In the example above, you can see that there is a an asterisk or a star symbol under the H. Uh, that means the following task would run every hour. So you can see that right here, this uh, runs every hour, uh, every hour at 17 minutes in. Now let's get to our back door. Add this line into our cron job file. Uh, this is the, actually, I believe that might be every 17 minutes. I'm not sure. Uh, that's one of those things that, again, typically what you're doing with this is just replicating one of the already ta or tests already in here. Keep in mind, this is also very, very obvious for anyone that's doing forensics on this. So you're typically going to want to avoid this where possible. There are better methods to do this. And again, this is really where the value of having that C2 is going to be at because you can live in memory and that's really where you want to be ultimately. So adding our back door, we can see that we are having this run on every minute of every hour of every day of the month. Uh, we are curling and so we're sending this back door to ourselves. Notice that we put a star symbol to everything. This means that our task will run every minute, every hour, every day, etc. We first use curl to download a file and then we pipe it to bash. So we're saying, hey, we want to get that file, uh, which is just our shell in this case, and then we're sending it to bash to actually execute it. The contents of the shell file that we are already uh, using are simply, so this starts out with a shebang, uh, bin bash saying that it needs to be run with bash, and then this is just sending a bash shell to the IP and then the port that we specify. Pretty straightforward. We would have to run an HTTP server serving our shell in this specific case. You can achieve this by running python 3 -m -htp server 8080 This is something to commit to memory. If you don't already have it memorized, I would put this in your notes. 
Once our shell gets downloaded, it will be executed by bash and we would get a shell. Don't forget to listen on your specified port with netcat-nvlp and then port, so setting up your listener here. Please note that this backdoor isn't really hidden because any, everyone can see crontabs by just looking in the uh, crontab file. Uh, what does the letter M mean in crontabs? That's going to be month, or let's see, months, there we go. Maybe. Oh, it might be minute. There we go. I'm thinking of the wrong thing. This month is M-O-N. There we go. And then H is going to be hour. And there we go. Again, this is something that, just be aware, this is very, very obvious. Just, if you can, this is one of those things to have as a backup and potentially just chuck on there for fun. There are better ways of doing this. This is one to be aware of, though. This is a little bit more interesting when you consider it within the uh, privilege escalation uh, vector. You're typically going to be looking at these scheduled tasks more so from uh, looking at something that you can exploit for performing privesk. <laughs> Putting it as a backdoor is far less common, but again, still something to consider. We'll go ahead and mark that as complete and then move into task 5.bashrc backdoor, something a lot more interesting. Let's now get into the .bashrc backdoor. If a user has bash as their login shell, the .bashrc file in their home directory is executed when an interactive session is launched. So if you know any users that log onto their system quite often, targeting uh, devs in this case can be very effective, you could simply run this command to include your reverse shell into their bashrc. Uh, this is something that not as many people know about, and it is very, very useful. This is one that, especially within that cyber defense competition range, this is simple, it's effective, and you're probably not going to get caught. So you can see very straight one, uh, one liner here. Again, where make sure you change that IP and port with your IP and port. But this is a great way to have a secondary backdoor. You can shell every single user on the system that uh, has a dot uh, bash RC. So you make sure that you're getting shells every single time this happens. Just make sure that you have an atcat listener ready so that you can receive that shell. So, and we have a note right here to make sure that you are ready to uh, actually catch that. This attack is very sneaky as no one really thinks about ever checking their .bash RC file. This is one that if you are a defense team uh, for cyber defense competitions, make sure you check this when you are getting your machine. This is probably already uh, infected. On the other hand, if you, uh, you can't exactly know if there are any users will actually log into their system, so you might wait a really long period of time. This is where putting this in every single users.bashrc can really pay off. You understand what the uh, .bashrc backdoor uh, technique. So we'll go ahead and mark that as complete, and we're gonna move into the final task, pam underscore unix.so backdoors. Let's get into the fifth and last backdoor of this room. There are many, many more backdoors available other than the five shown in this room. This is just a really nice starter set, especially as uh, you are starting to compromise boxes and get it a little bit familiar with offensive uh, security. You can start practicing these and they're a lot of fun. This is one of those things that as you complete CTF, so maybe the Mr. Robot room, go back, do this, try setting up some backdoors and play around with it. A good resource that I found really helpful, so the room creator when creating this room, is this link. It looks like that is a nine ways to backdoor a Linux box uh, article, probably worth checking out. So feel free to take a look through there. Okay, so now on to the fifth backdoor. Again, commentary on this. I've said it a couple times in this room. Be sure to check out uh, more specifically the... Uh, uh, C2 frameworks because a lot of them have automatic backdoors that are built in and those are a lot of times more flexible and they're going to tie automatically into your C2 framework which is going to give you a lot more power. The backdoor that we are going to look at is the pam underscore unix dot so backdoor. If you don't know what the file pam underscore unix dot so is, well it is simply one of the many files in Linux that is responsible for authentication. PAM, it stands for, in this case, Pluggable Authentication Modules, I believe. Uh, SSH ties in this. This is something that if you ever have to get Kerberos working with a Linux box, it, hopefully it's not on FreeBSD. I've had a lot of trouble trying to get Kerberos tied into that, uh, but it's one of these things that you'll become very, very familiar with PAM very quickly. So let's actually get into the back door. So we can see that we have this little snippet of code. 
as seen here, the file pam underscore unix dot so uses the unix verify password function to verify the user supply password. And we can see that we have that right here. Now let's look at this screenshot. Uh, don't worry too much if this is going a little bit over your head. Just know that we have this method that we are targeting in particular. So taking a look at this screenshot, we can see that we've added a new line of code or a new line to our code. If string compare uh, p, uh, so the password equals 0x and then the string, uh, we are going to make sure that we are returning this as uh, successful. So we are adding essentially a uh, verification here, we're actually going to walk through it here. We're adding a, an extra step to this verification, which we can <laughs> just have our own backdoored password in. So uh, first, we'll have to know what the function strcmp does. This function basically compares two strings. In the screenshot above, we compare the variable p and the string 0x. Uh, I'm not going to butcher that. Uh, the variable p stands for the user supplied password. In other words, the password that is uh, that the user supplied. It's just going to be what's entered into text typically, especially if they're using a standard login. You can also see the uh, not equal to zero at the end of the statement. This means if uh, not successful. So if the variable uh, P, user supplied password, and the string are not the same, the Unix, uh, uh, so it will pass it to the actual uh, verification method here. So we have another way that we can actually, uh, we're adding a step beforehand before the actual authentication method. So if the password matches this, we can log in automatically. If not, we're going to go to the standard authentication there. So on the other hand, if the variable uh, and the string are the same, the authentication is a success. We will mark the success by using pam underscore success, which we can see right here. So this backdoor essentially consists of adding your own password to the pam underscore unix dot so. Since you know the password that you added into the file, you will always be able to authenticate with that password until it's removed from that specific file. So let's do a little recap. Say a user types the password password123 and tries to authenticate. We will compare his password uh, to the string that we've inserted into this. If the strings match, authentication is successful. So we've added that in that we can just authenticate as any user. But those two strings, if they don't match, uh, the authentication will just be passed to the standard Unix verify password function, and then it just does no more authentication. This is just comparing it uh, to the user's password from Etsy Shadow and making sure that they're the same and allowing that user to log in. This is how the intended authentication should work. However, this technique is called a backdoor as you add your own password that you can always use to log in as nobody, uh, and it, it takes out of the pam underscore unix.so. So we're adding our own password and we can authenticate it as any user. Uh, this backdoor is really hard to spot as once again, nobody really thinks about looking into such files. Uh, this is a really good one. This is one that I definitely would say would not get caught immediately. This is definitely a lot lesser known. Um, and this is one that I definitely would recommend having in your arsenal. Since the, uh, this method is slowly becoming more and more popular, you probably won't be able to use it every time as everyone would surely, uh, slowly but surely understand how to protect themselves. So you can see some resources there. We can go ahead and mark this as complete since we understand the art of Linux backdoors and we'll mark this as complete to go ahead and finish the room. So moving forward, I would definitely recommend taking these and applying them to a Linux box that you've already gone through run through it again. It could just be a simple one. Practice these backdoors, start getting them into muscle memory so that you are familiar with them. They're very useful for engagements and especially this one. And let's see the bash RC backdoor. Those are really going to be the ones that are going to be very, very, very valuable tools in your arsenal. Otherwise that's going to do it for this video. If you have any questions, I've left links to the TriHack B discord as well as the dark sec discord in the description below. Otherwise, until next time, happy hacking.